Hello and welcome to another video on the best games of a letter arcade edition and this is for the letter L. Yes in this video series I imagine what if I could only choose five games per letter per system and discard all others. What would I choose? So this means I'm not coming at it from the point of view of what games are most important to video gaming history or even which games are most beloved. But instead, for me personally, what games do I enjoy playing above all else? Now my choices here may surprise you, but this video series it's just a bit of fun to rekindle people's memories and help give people suggestions of what games to play the next time they're looking through their retro laden lists of gold to decide what to play. Now this letter L was an interesting letter to choose for, particularly because there was lots of games that I thought would be big hitters and ones that I would actually had a lot of time for. but. When when I went back to them I found that I didn't really enjoy them as much as I thought. Still in the end I'm really happy with my choices and I hope you enjoy this voyage of discovery as much as me. Okay so now we come to my fifth choice and I've chosen Sega's lesser known 3D fighter Last Bronx, Tokyo Bangachi released in 1996 and set in an alternate timeline where after the big financial crash of Tokyo around 1992 has resulted in Tokyo being run by criminal gangs with constant warfare. This game was made by AM3 who worked on the Virtuon series and takes much of the same fighting mechanics of the Virtua Fighter series but including cooler and edgier characters. Now I bought the Saturn version back in the day and I found this a really solid fighter and a perfect accompaniment to the Virtua Fighter 2 series because it essentially is the same mechanics and fun of that game but with for me the cooler street gangs fighting vibe I actually sort of really appreciate alongside the more standard art martial artists of the Virtua Fighter series. And that's it really with this game, it's a solid, fun, pretty ace 3D fighter, it's got lovely backdrops, an eclectic roster of players to punch and kick your way through and it's one that seldom gets talked about today so I really wanted to sort of sing its praises here. So give this game a go and see what you think. It emulates brilliantly on the Model 2 emulator so there's no excuse not to give this game a go. Okay, so that brings me on to my fourth choice, and I've gone for another fighter, this time called Last Blade 2 by SNK, and released in 1998. This is a beautiful 2D fighting game with all the glorious hand drawn, detailed artwork of SNK fighters mixed in with them carrying weapons to give that extra dimension. The backdrops in this game are also worthy of note, being drop dead gorgeous, and an Along with all the smooth and detailed animations, I think that this is one of my favourite 2D beat-em-ups of all time. I just find it all so sumptuous with the moves and the characters. And For me, I think this is actually probably one of my favourite SNK series that was ever released. Now, the home ports for this were all arcade perfect, really. Of course, there's the Neo Geo CD version and their latter Dreamcast version, which are really impressive. And it actually extended over the original arcade cartridge by adding an extra quiz mode, voice cutscenes and a gallery selection for both of these titles. A little bit later on there was also the Last Blade PS2 collection which contained this and the first game. And that's well worth tracking down, although very expensive today. But thankfully, nowadays, the game is on all the consoles, really, and is very cheap. And all the versions have online play, so it's great that you can enjoy this game and play other fighters around the world. It's just a wonderful place we live in with gaming. Right, okay, so let's go on to my third choice. And this is a fantastic title by Taito called Legend of Cage. Now, the fact that this this came out in 1985 blows my mind and based on the title screen it actually said it was developed in 1984 but we know it didn't get released until 1985 and that is amazing because this is a smooth scrolling ninja 
fest that has you super jump around the screen, hurling shurikens and swiping your blades as you attack the swarms of ninjas coming at you. Now the story here is pretty standard. You play a ninja called Cade, who's apparently a boy, uh, who must rescue Princess Kiri, who's been kidnapped and taken by dead ninjas. Yes, you're fighting zombie ninjas who've come back to life. Now I will say, Cage does look a little bit effeminate here. In fact, back in the day, I genuinely assumed it was a female protagonist, and I thought it was a beautiful lesbian love rescue romance as opposed to the more standard void rescues girl trope. But the story here doesn't really matter. This is about crouching tiger and hidden dragoning across the landscape, doing massive jumps and climbing trees, which is a huge amount of fun. All set to the plinky plinky Japanese Koto music running in the background by the capable hands of Hisayoshi Agura, who's worked on everything for Taito, really, from New Zealand Story to the Darius games. You see, overall, I really enjoy the freedom that this game gives you as you perform wire foo, jumping superhuman leaps running from tree to tree, building to building, and some fun final level bosses thrown in as well. Yes, for me, overall, this is a solid, fluid action platform adventure that is so much fun to play. Now, this had a stack of home ports back in the day on the 8-bit platforms, with the best being on the NES console, in my opinion. Later on, it appeared in the arcade perfect form on Taito Legends 2, which came out on the PS2 Xbox era. Also, even better, on the Taito Legends power-up collection on the PSP, it even had an enhanced version of this game, being a remastered version alongside the original, which is a lovely way to play this game as well. Now, you can pick this game up still on the PS4 as part of the arcade archives, so there's plenty of ways to still track down a give this game a go and of course as you're seeing here MAME runs it perfectly as well. Right okay well, let's come to my number two choice and for this I've gone for the brilliant platform game Load Runner. This is an arcade version by Irem and released in 1984 being licensed from Bruderbund who of course had taken this runaway mega hit on the Apple II by Doug Smith who of course created this amazingly addictive platformer. Now for those not familiar familiar what Load Runner is, the purpose of the game is to run around, collect all the gold on the single screen for an exit ladder to appear and go on to the next level before the timer runs out. So far so easy, but stopping you in achieving this, there are enemies such as cavemen, spiders, slinkies and later on robots who will do everything within their power to stop you within their quest. These enemies are smart and quick at taking you down. Thankfully though, your arm with a shovel that allows you to dig quick holes on either side of you to temporarily capture them or giving you an escape route downwards. And this gives the game a lot of complexity, strategy and fun to the proceedings because digging those holes is so prevalent and gives this game a lot more depth than similar platform games of the time. So it's so much fun tackling all the 24 levels before it loops and gives you tougher enemies. And you think, for 84, that's quite an ungenerous amount of screens to be tackling in the game. Now, Load Runners appeared on pretty much every home console, but this arcade version, which is kind of like a remaster, I think is the best version to play. It has much better graphics, in-game music, and it's really a classic game. It still retains all the fun gameplay of that original. Sadly, the arcade version has never ever made it to a compilation or sold anywhere separately at any time. So unless you're lucky enough to stumble across it in the arcades, very unlikely sadly, then MAME is the only way to go to play this. Incidentally, there were four more arcade sequels in the series that were done, all offering more of the same but with different enemies and layouts for you to take on. And in fact, the fifth in the series was actually made by Psycho, not Irem. And this was a different affair with it being released in 2000 and was two screen, making it far more competitive and having you pitting you directly against player to player to try and collect the most gold. Yes, overall, this is a fab arcade game and this is the definitive version of 
this game series in my humble opinion so give this a go any way you can track down mame etc you won't be disappointed okay let's come on to my number one choice for the letter l in the arcades and i've chosen limited edition hang on okay okay before you decry my devilishness of copping out choosing essentially super hang on under the letter l well i've only half cheated because this is actually a different game to the super hang on version you see released a few years later in 1991 by sega this is a lot more easier and forgiving to play and therefore consequently it makes it a lot more fun to play and so for me at least this is the best version to track down and give it a go especially if you're hankering for that super hang on fix now, the original game came out in 1987, and the game offered the player a full sit-down blue bike, allowing you to feel every twist and turn of the track as you play and ride through the wonderful levels. And thankfully, on this limited edition version, mere gaming mortals such as myself are actually able to complete all the tracks, as opposed to the tough as old motorbike boots original, where you were lucky to get onto stage three, quite frankly feed let alone see most of the game okay for those who've never heard of super hang on though well it's a yu suzuki sega classic being a sequel to sega's hang on game and this means you're in a motorbike racing along tracks and must reach checkpoint after checkpoint before the timer runs out the sequel adds a lot more here with rising and falling tracks and a turbo button allowing your bike to go even faster if you risk it there's also four courses to choose from here as well so you can race in Africa, Asia, America and Europe all of growing difficulty depending on what you choose and that's what I love about this game I just adore it with it taking all that was great about that Hang On original but improving upon it with selectable amazing music by composers Tashihiro Hayashi and Kochi Namiki who've worked on the music for games like Galaxy Force 2 and Thunderblade music and they've really outdone themselves here with four all-time classic tunes to burn rubber to with Outrider Crisis and Winning Run being particular favourites of mine. But it's the gameplay here that really shines with Super Hang On running blisteringly fast and smooth over the original Hang On game and with tracks far more complex and interesting with hills this time making this even more fun to play. Now thankfully Super Hang On as opposed to the limited Hang On that we're discussing here did have multiple ports back in the day with the Amiga ST and Mega Drive being particularly impressive. In fact, in fact, it was the Amiga home port that was the initial reason I decided to buy an Amiga. Years later, the game was also released on the Sega Vintage Collection on the Xbox 360 and PS3. This was a really solid arcade port of the game, and even better, worked with 3D TVs to show the game in visual 3D, which was really, really cool. Actually, talking of 3D, my most favourite port of this game is actually on the 3DS with 3D Super Hang On. This is perfect and allows you to play also in visual 3D, but without glasses, which is really, really cool. And it really genuinely pops out at you as you're racing. Yes, overall, this is a really special game to me. And I urge you to try this specific version because if you're like me and you just can't, you know, you're not a gaming god and you can't get very far and get frustrated by the brutal difficulty of the arcade original well this is a great alternative to give you more fun as you race your way through as opposed to the arcade coin guzzling original so there you go that was my top five games for the letter l of course there's always some big hitters and a few honorable mentions that fail to make my list but i'm going to briefly mention them here for you to go through them okay the first big hitter is probably last jewel interplanet war 2012, released in 1987 by Capcom. This was made by Takashi Nishiyama, yes, he of Street Fighter 1 and King of Fighter fame. And this is a weird shooter that has you drive or later on fly your way against the Gaiden tribe who's invaded your planet Mu. Now, despite the game being really popular back in the day, it had loads of home ports. I've never really been a fan of this game and I find it a pretty average blaster actually, which is why it didn't make my 
my list. Now talking of average, another one for me that's average is LED Storm. This is another Capcom arcade game and it was again a big hitter in the day. Released in 1989 and it, it was basically an update to the classic bump and jump game. Having you race on skyway roads, bashing and jumping the fellow racers to make it first. It's also known as Mad Gear in Japan and this is another Takashi Nishiyama title for Capcom before of course he moved to SNK. Actually finishing the Takashi Nishiyama trilogy there's another game that he did for Capcom called Legendary Wings released in 1986. Now this game was also popular back in the day and it is mega mega tough i mean i'm talking kick you in the nuts kind of shooter but if you can look past that brutal unforgiving difficulty there is a definitely a solid shooter here and in fairness to the game it's never unfair it's just very very difficult now i'm a huge fan of light gun games and i really dislike the era when they stopped doing hand-drawn sprites and switching to digitized sprites in the early 90s because I think there's so much that's given to actually drawing and doing true character design rather than just filming some Z-class actors to be the sprites in the game. Now a good example of why I didn't like those digitised shooters in the early 90s is this game, Lethal Enforcers and it was released by Konami in 1992. As you can see here, this was really popular back in the day, but cut away the dull, blocky, digitised graphics. This is really something that pales in comparison to many light gun shooters out there. So as you can probably tell, I'm not a fan. Now, they did do a sequel in 1994, which this time set it in the Wild West. And it's more of the same, really, although I do prefer the setting slightly more than the original. OK, another big hitter was Life Force, released by Konami. And this is essentially the US release of the 1986 game Salamander or Nemesis 2. But this game has a more of an organic look as they were trying to take on the might of our type at the time. It also changes the power-up system to be more in keeping with the game radius. The game's alright, although I've never been, if I'm honest, I've never really got into a lot of the horizontal shooters. And Life Force is one of them. Okay, finally we come to the last big hitter and this is a real classic by Atari and it's called Luna Lander and released way back in 1979 and this was I believe one of the first vector games ever released now what do you do well in the game you must carefully use your thrust and dwindling fuel supply to safely land your Luna on a variety of pads on the moon each with their own varying scores multiplier depending on its difficulty now this game is far more fun than it has any right to be being a real refreshing slower paced take on all the usual arcade twitch gameplay and it's one that I do enjoy playing now and again okay so they were the big hitters now let's talk about some of the lesser known titles worthy of your time okay now this is an interesting one it's called lethal thunder or in japan it's known as thunder blaster it's another irem classic and it was released in 1991 this is quite a weird one because it's a vertical shooter but the gimmick is is that you build up your firepower to stronger shots by quickly pressing the fire button multiple times so it's a bit like track and field to build up your bullet power to take on the harder enemies as quickly as possible. Now it's a bit pointless really the idea but it is quite an enjoyable little blaster so well worth tracking down and giving this one a go as well. Now another interesting game and one that I think I want to spend a lot more time with myself is Lethal Crash Race released in 1993 by the Video Systems Company and this is an overhead racer but there's lots of tracks here all around the world that you race in and there's a lovely large assortment of vehicles that you can choose from as you race consequently i found that this was a really fun game and definitely one that i'm gonna put a few more hours against talking of fun there's this brilliant little hidden arcade gem called lucky and wild which was released by namco in 1983 
3, this was still using the glorious sprite scaling technique and had the wonderful idea of mixing in a light gun that you could hold whilst you were driving. Essentially, this was Namco's answer to Chase HQ, but it's got loads of neat ideas and touches here in the game, and it really blows my mind that this is such a rare game to find today, and it never ever saw a home port, which is such a crying shame. Still, as you can see, Main does a pretty good job of emulating it, although you can never quite get that full experience of the light gun and the steering wheel that you do get in the arcade original. Okay, so now we come to a Sega game, and this is Le Mans 24, released in 1997. No, not to be confused with the brilliant Infocom Le Mans 24-hour game that came out on the Dreamcast and also the PS2. This is an okay Sega arcade racer that, that does a reasonable job of depicting you racing the Le Mans track. I do however feel that it misses something. It's missing some of the magic of the Sega arcade racing pixel dust in my opinion. And it's probably the reason why it never ever saw a home port anywhere. But if you want to play it today, well it's quite rare to see in the arcades. But an alternative is the Supermodel 3 emulator does a reasonable job, aside from a few graphical glitches, of recreating this game and you can see for yourself what you think. For me I've always felt Le Mans 24 is a bit of a missed opportunity. Now this is an interesting one was a cute action puzzler being locomotion released in 1982 and by the company Centurai and it was developed by Konami. Now the idea is simple here move around the tracks like a sliding block puzzle to keep the trains on the track and stopping them from crashing whilst reaching the stations along the edge. Things become pretty frantic here and it is a really fun simple game especially when you get multiple trains on the track it really keeps you on your toes. Now talking of puzzlers Logic Pro Adventure released in 1999 by Amuse World Corp is another one that I love spending time with. This is essentially the game Picross or Minesweeper on the PC and for those who perhaps don't know those games essentially the idea is, is you have numbers along the side that denotes the pattern of that particular column or row that you're looking at and therefore from there you can logically deduce which is the coloured in squares and which ones aren't and then you mark them up accordingly. Eventually, when you draw the whole picture, it will show a very stylized, simplistic view of some object, and therefore you're allowed to progress to the next level. Now, there was actually loads in the Logic Pro series that came out in the arcade, but I've chosen Logic Pro Adventures, which was the last in that series, because I think it gives you the most sense of progression in the game, and it's uh, for those looking for something a bit different from your usual arcade fare. This is Logic Pro Adventure is well worth giving yourself time with. Now another game I should mention is Liquid Kids released in 1990 by Taito. This is a massively cute platformer that has you play a platypus hippopotamus hybrid called Hippo the Hippo and there's lots of cute charm here but I've always found the game a little bit clunky if I'm honest. I've never really sort of gelled with it as I do with a lot of the other Taito games. Still I know it's popular with many so it's right to include them here. But finally though, the game that I really want to shout out as a hidden gem and to be honest it should have made my top 5 really. It was only my love of Last Bronx just winning me over at last minute. And the game that should have really made it was Ladybug released in 1981 by Universal. Now this was Universal's answer to Pac-Man here but it's more than a clone. It's got rotating doors that allow you to change the maze layout it's got letters strewn around spelling the word extra to give you an extra life. And I think all of these ideas that were unique to this game really elevates it from a mere Pac-Man clone to a worthy game in its own right. And it's so addictive to play. Right, there you go. That was my top five for the letter L. Now, it's a surprisingly tough letter because I felt 
It was weak, really, with many disappointments for me personally. But overall, I think I'm really happy with the choices that I made here. And the only slight pang, as I mentioned, was that Ladybird perhaps should have made my list over Last Bronx. But I have such fond memories of that Last Bronx game that it just won me over in the end. Anyway, look out for my next video covering the letter M. Now, this is going to be a really interesting letter to go through. And I'm still pondering what I'm going to choose for this one. So until next time, keep it retro.